بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعه داه أما بعد Apologies إخوان في today's uh, late beginning of we moved to some place in the hills somewhere <laughs> oh, Allah we're not used to this uh, this country country living إخوان الحمد لله we, we found our way here eventually we pick up أيها الإخوان with that which is related to the seerah of the Messenger وسلم, our concise study and in the last session we looked at years 1 to 3 of the Messenger وسلم, giving da'wah we also discussed that which is related to the fourth year after the bi'thah and we remind the brothers and sisters that we're looking at two periods the years after the bi'thah and the bi'thah is when the Prophet وسلم, was sent as a prophet when he was informed that he was to be a prophet and the first verses of the Qur'an were sent down upon him and then we had that which occurs after the migration which are the years after the hijrah and so you uh, you'll be or you'll benefit from having a knowledge of these two periods because you will come across that in the writings of the people of knowledge this occurred in the fifth year after the bi'tha or the fifth year after the hijrah and you should know the difference between these two terms and so so far we're looking purely at the years before the hijrah yani the years of the bi'tha so the prophet sallam after the fourth year we just to remind you the first three years the prophet sallam gave the da'wah sirriya the secret da'wah after the fourth year the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave the da'wah or made the da'wah apparent uh, and that call that came from the Messenger of Allah وسلم, caused those who were with him as it caused him to be persecuted by the pagans and by the kuffar of Quraysh. And if it were not for the fact that this was a concise seerah, then there are many stories, Ikhwan, authentic stories about the persecution that took place and the, the varying debates that the Messenger of Allah had with the kuffar of Quraysh. On the basis of the persecution and the difficulty that the companions were going through, they migrated to Habasha. And of course, the Prophet ﷺ informed them of the fact that there is a king there, King Negus, King Najashi, who no man is wronged in his kingdom. And so they went, they explained that they were believers, and they were following the messenger Muhammad ﷺ, who was sent with a new book and with a new message, and he's upon the way and the path of the previous prophets and messengers and King Najashi being a man of knowledge and aql and understanding he recognized that it was truth that they were speaking and he recognized that truly this was the messenger that the scripture spoke of would come and so he rejected the kuffar of Quraysh who had come to try and convince him that these were nothing more than rebel rousers and troublemakers and that you should not allow them to remain within your kingdom he rejected them even though they brought him gifts and wealth and he said that by Allah I will not give them to you regardless of what it is you offer by way of gifts and he allowed them to stay within the kingdom as long as they please they remain within the kingdom for a period and as we mentioned it was said a rumor began to spread that the people of Mecca had entered into Islam and that was because of a qissa or because of a story that took place when the Prophet ﷺ recited from Surah Al-Najm and at the end of the Surah Allah Azza wa Jal mentions أَفَمِنْ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ تَعْجَبُونَ وَتَدْحَكُونَ وَلَا تَبْكُونَ وَأَنْتُمْ سَامِدُونَ فَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ وَعْبُدُونَ Then will you be amazed at this hadith and will you laugh and will you not cry wasting your time in frivolous amusement and so fall in prostration to Allah Azza wa Jalla and worship him the Prophet Sallallahu fell into prostration the believers fell into prostration and on the basis of the brevity and the weight of what they heard the kuffar fell into prostration likewise everyone except for Abu Jahl who took some dirt and threw it on his forehead yeah, and that was all purely based upon kibber and arrogance and haughtiness 
with these verses, Ikhwan, for the first time they were taken by them. And they were truly affected by them because they were being told, don't listen. And this is, of course, Ikhwan, we have to stop and extrapolate benefits. These are from the Asalib, and these are from the methods that are used by the enemies of the Dao in every time. And they encourage the people not to listen to the people of the Haqq. Don't listen to them. Oh, because they're going to tell you this one is wrong and they're going to encourage you to refute or they're going to encourage you, yeah, whatever method and means they use. Oh, they're only going to speak about people. Oh, they're only going to... Whatever way that they can use or find to turn people away from the people of the Haqq. Why? Because they know that the Haqq, as the Salaf of this Ummah used to say, alayhi nur. The truth has light upon it. And that nur connects with the heart of the believer, the one who still remains upon his fitrah. He recognizes it. He sees that it is haq. He sees that it is true. And Allah Azza wa has created within him the fitrah and the innate nature that recognizes truth for truth. And so the person of aql and intellect and astuteness and who is smart and intelligent will look above the fact that yani, I may not be able to see eye to eye with the person who's telling this to me, but it's truth. Or that, you know, I, I'm not too happy, perhaps, with something of his character, which is oftentimes another accusation. Yani, and this is an indication of the fact that the people are running out of things to attempt to use against the people of the Haq. Oh, bad manners. Bad character. And again, that is usually nine times out of ten, batil, false. That when you meet with the people of Sunnah and Haq, they're usually very well mannered, usually. And what they mean by bad character is that they're speaking about people that we like. That is usually what they mean by bad character. Ordinarily, you speak to them, Salam, Kef Halak, Salaam, Tayyibin, MashaAllah. Yeah, and he smiles and warm welcomes, and other than that, like everyone else, better sometimes. And so, this method is an usloob of those who fight against the haqq from the time of the Prophet. Whatever rumor that you can use, or whatever, yeah, and he, whatever dirt you can throw with the hope that some of it sticks. They will do so, even if they know it's batil and that it's false. Even if they know there's no place, no way, shape or form, is it true. So we hear fools running around in one with all types of statements. Oh, don't listen to anyone who tells you uh, that such and such is wrong. And what is the evidence? The evidence is the sheikh said, like who? Billahi alaykum. Who from the people of Sunnah has ever taught you or nurtured you in this way? Who? Or the Sheikh said. Who? You know that the people of Sunnah have been the first. If you've ever heard Dalil, evidence, Dalil, evidence, if you've ever heard that statement, you will know it come from the Salafis. And so whatever method, but because of the fact that Naam, we return our affairs back to our ulama. Naam, our ulama make judgments upon people. And that is the, the reality in some situations, judgments have to be made upon people. And the explanation and the breakdown of the problematic areas that this person is speaking about, Naam, the Sheikh, has been the best to explain this. And so to return you back to his explanation and his breakdown, using the evidence that he uses, quoting the speech of the person who's being spoken about, which is evidence enough, his speech. Not the sheikh said is the evidence, the speech of the person is the evidence. And we're digressing slightly, like in the point that we're trying to make, Ikhwan, is that these are methods that you should be aware of. Ahlul Haqq are always fought against Ikhwan by people of falsehood with falsehood. And as Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah he likewise mentions that the people of falsehood, and one of the beneficial principles that will aid you throughout your life, is that you know that falsehood, pure falsehood, 
pure falsehood, 100%, has never been a method or never been a school or a position that has been held by anyone. Pure falsehood. Rather, as Sheikh Islam and Taymiyyah, he mentions, truth of Afwan, falsehood is always, take it as a principle, it is always embellished with haq. Always. You never find somebody just going to speak pure batin, 100% batin, falsehood. Never. Falsehood is always embellished with haq, beautified with truth. And that is what makes the falsehood accept acceptable, acceptable because of what you recognize of truth. So because of the fact that they speak the truth within that falsehood, you recognize or you accept the falsehood that you don't know about. Because, well, that is true and I know that to be true. And so that other point or these other issues, I'm not really familiar with them, I haven't really heard of them, but this is a man that speaks truth. Why? Because falsehood is always embellished with truth. Very important principle for us uh, to be acquainted with. And this is Ikhwan, so we're never duped by people who attempt to present falsehood in the garb of truth. And so, within these first four years, we had the initial stages of the da'wah of the Prophet ﷺ. After the incident with the recitation of the messenger in front of the Kaaba, the rumor was spread that the people of Mecca had entered into Islam, and so the Muhajirun who made the migration to Habasha, they came back to Mecca, of course, expecting and hearing if the rumors were true, that the people of Mecca had entered into Islam. But the only thing that had occurred was that they made sajda because of the weight of what they heard, but not that they had entered into Islam. And so when this occurred, those who had made the migration to Habasha, to Abyssinia, and returned back to Mecca, they were of two types. There were those who remained in Mecca until the migration to Medina. And then there were those who went back to Habasha. The, the group that went back to Habasha was far greater in number than the first group that went. As we said, there were 11 men and 5 women that went initially. But when they returned, there was over 80 of them who went back. From those who went back, some of them remained in Habasha for 10 years while some migrated when the Prophet ﷺ and the companions migrated from Mecca to Medina. And so there were groups, some of them went back after the first migration to Mecca, Mecca and stayed, didn't go back to Abyssinia. Some of them went back to Abyssinia and a larger group of individuals followed them up until either the migration to Medina or some 10 years after they went back. And this all occurred in the fifth year uh, after the Be'atha. The fifth year after the Be'atha. So this year, Ayyuhal Ikhwa, was one that continued for the Messenger of Allah وسلم, to be years of persecution. And even when the uh, companions made the migration to Medina, Afwan to uh, Habasha, the Prophet ﷺ remained in Mecca, giving da'wah, calling to Allah, being persecuted. And they used varying means of uh, persecution or trying to fight against the da'wah of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. Mujadalat, argumentation, they would go to the people of the book and ask them questions to ask the Prophet ﷺ to try and catch him out. A false prophet would not know this. Ask him this, ask him that. The Yahud would give them answers or give them questions to ask the Prophet Wasallam. Ask him this. And so much of the ayat in the Quran, they ask you about such and such, say to them. This is because they would approach, they would go to the people of the book, ask them questions, go back to the Prophet Wasallam, ask him what they told him, told them to ask him. And the Prophet Wasallam, of course, each and every time, would respond with nothing but the haqq. They went to the Prophet ﷺ and said and asked him, what was the food that Ya'qub 
that Israel, Ya'qub, who was an, yani, Israel, one of the names of Ya'qub, what was the food that he made haram upon himself? Since Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran, كُلُّ الطَّعَامِ كَانَ هِلَّا لِبَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ إِلَّا مَا حَرَّمَ إِسْرَائِيلَ عَلَى نَفْسِي إِلَّا مَا حَرَّمَ إِسْرَائِيلُ عَلَى نَفْسِي مِنْ قَبْلِ أَن تُنَزَّلُ التَّوْرَاتِ all food was halal for Bani Israel other than that which Israel made haram upon himself yani Yaqub, before the Torah was revealed so they said what was it that Ismail or Israel made haram upon himself and if you're a man of, of, of Allah جل, and a man of deen you should know I said the Prophet he said that verily Israel suffered on an occasion from sciatica and so he saw nothing to have affected him other than the camel's meat and camel's milk that he had previously eaten and so he made it haram upon himself because of this sciatica sciatica is a it's a pain it's a nervous pain that ordinarily starts from the lower back and it runs it continues over weeks and runs down the leg and oftentimes down into the into the big toe but it progressively moves down the leg and it's painful for those who have ever suffered from it but it ordinarily starts as a pain in the lower back then it progressively moves down the leg either one leg or both legs and so when he suffered from it he saw nothing to blame other than the meat and the milk which as a side benefit has an indication of the fact that the prophets and messengers understood that ailments, disease, return back to diet, to food and diet. And so whatever it was they would present to him, the Prophet would respond. They would ask him, Mathalan, about the child. How? Does the child resemble the mother or resemble the father? How is a child a male or female? The Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned if the issue of the man precedes the issue of the woman, then it will resemble him. And if her issue, yani her ejaculation, precedes his then it will resemble her and if his overpowers hers then it will be a boy if hers overpowers his it will be a girl issues the one that they continue to ask and the Prophet ﷺ would continue to respond with the wahi and so they saw that that was futile so they moved on to another strategy and that is that they would ask or they would approach the Prophet ﷺ. first and foremost for him to stop of course when he refused then they approached Abu Talib the one who was protecting him and said that this man is creating a problem and is causing calamities and splitting between the tribes and the tribesmen and causing dissension in the families you have to do something you're the one that's protecting him and so Abu Talib he sat with the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said that they are making this statement concerning you and perhaps if you were to yeah, to leave or to stop this and so Abu, Abu uh, so the Prophet Sallallahu he said to Abu Talib his uncle that verily I am no more able to leave that which Allah has sent me with than you are able to take a ray from the sun it's haq and Allah Azza wa has commanded him to convey it and so that, that was what the Prophet Sallam conveyed and they moved on to another strategy and that strategy Ikhwan was talab al-mu'jizat wal khawariq seeking miracles seeking yani for of course unnatural occurrences to take place let, if, if what you're saying is true then let a book come down from the sky if what you're saying is true then turn Mount Safa into gold if you turn Mount Safa into gold this occurs in an authentic narration they said to the Prophet if you turn Mount Safa into gold 
then we will believe in, in you. We will follow you. And so the Prophet said, Awatafa'al, will you really, honestly? If I supplicate, you would? And so they said, nah. And so the Prophet Sallallahu supplicated. And when he supplicated, Jibra'il came to him and said that indeed, my Lord has informed me to inform you that if you wish and if you will, then he will turn Mount Safa into gold. But if they do not believe after that, then he will punish them with a the punishment the like of which he has never punished any people. He said, or he can leave for them the door of tawbah wa rahmah, of repentance and mercy. And of course the Prophet Sallallahu being uh, the most merciful of the creation to the creation he said he said bal babu rahmati wa tawba he said rather leave then the door of mercy and tawba open to them they asked for a sign a clear cut sign and so when they continued to ask the prophet sallam for a sign the messenger showed them a sign ikhwan that would be categorical and you need no sign other than that sign the messenger of Allah sallallahu wasallam, when they asked him for a sign he pointed towards the moon and the moon as Anas ibn Malik and others mentioned the moon split into two one half of the moon sat on one mountain and the other sat and another set of mountains. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Fashhadu. He said, then bear witness, observe. So what was their response? Anas mentions that they responded by saying, Saharana Muhammad. They've said, Muhammad has bewitched our eyes. Just as they always have said, yeah, and it is nothing but magic, nothing but sihar. But they would likewise make the claim, if you were to do such and such, we would believe. If you were to allow such and such to come down, we would believe. Let a book come down from the sky, we will believe. Cause the a punishment to rain down upon, you, upon us, if what you are saying is true. Throughout the Quran, we hear Allah Azza wa Jal mentioning their statement, فَأْتِنَا بِمَا تَعِدُنَا إِن كُنتُم, إن كنتم مِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ in kunta min as-sadiqeen fa'atina bima ta'iduna bring us what you've promised us bring it to us bring the punishment if you're truthful and so of course the affair of punishment is in the hands of Allah Azawajal. and so in any case we mentioned in the, in the end of the last session the fact that in the sixth year after hijrah Umar radiallahu anhu embraced Islam and Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib similarly embraced and of course Ikhwan this was a huge huge victory for Islam and the Muslimin Prophet sallallahu alayhi he supplicated O oh Allah guide to Islam wa a'izz al-Islam bi ahabbi rajulaini ilayk Ennoble Islam with the most beloved of these two men to you, Umar ibn al Khattab or Abu Jahl. And Allah Azza wa Jal guided Umar. As far as the story of the Islam of Umar, then it should be known, Ikhwan, that the bulk of that which has been mentioned concerning the story of his Islam is not authentic. The well known story of him entering upon his sister and her husband and that they were recite, he was reciting the Qur'an and he slapped her, he slapped her husband uh, he made the, the mouths bleed and then he regret what he had done yeah, and it's a story that is not authentic uh, what is though sound and the most or the closest to being a story that is authentic another popular story is that Umar radiallahu anhu Abu Jahal 
had put out a bounty upon the head of the Prophet وسلم, of a hundred camels. And so Umar, when he heard of this bounty, he said, oh, it is for me. I'm going to go and find him and I'm going to kill him. Hundred camels, and it's for me. It's like, say, I'll give you a fleet of a hundred Mercedes Benz. And he like unto that. Or I'll give you a, a fleet of a hundred Maybachs. <laughs> a hundred Maybachs. A hundred. A hundred Lamborghinis. Now, and so the, this was not something that was simple or straightforward. And so when he made that or placed that bounty, then this was something that was interesting, of course, to any bounty killer. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so, Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, this is for me. And so he went to the Kaaba in order to try and find the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he went to the Kaaba, he heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reciting the Quran. He said, that he heard him reciting and he said to himself, he must be a kahin, he must be a soothsayer. And when he made that statement to himself, no, he said he, was, he must be a poet. When he heard, made that statement to himself, the Prophet ﷺ recited, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرٍ and this is not the statement of a poet. Little indeed do you reflect. He said that it is the statement of a soothsayer. And Allah and Prophet Sallam recited, Wala bi qawli kahin. Neither is it the statement of a soothsayer. Little do you understand. Tanzeelun min rabbil alameen. It is revelation from Allah Azza wa Jal. From the Lord of all the worlds, and if He were to make a statement against us, attribute to us a statement, then we would take Him by His yameen, take Him by His right hand, and then we would cut off His jugular veins. And so Umar radiallahu anhu, when he heard these verses, this was one of the causes of the inspiration of his inspiration to be guided to Islam. And this narration likewise is not authentic. <laughs> Just mentioning some of the narrations. <laughs> the one narration that possibly is authentic though is the uh, narration of one of the female companions, Binti Abi Hathama, who on an occasion when they were planning and they were packing, and preparing to join those who have migrated to Abyssinia. And this was a woman and a family that Umar radiallahu anhu had persecuted. Her, her, her husband Amir, that he was persecuting them and terrorizing them. And so he passed by their household and saw them packing. And so he said, where are you going? You're leaving. And so she said that verily we have had enough. We have had enough of the persecution and the hardness, harshness and the terrible treatment. We're going to leave. We're migrating. And so she said that by Allah I could see, I could see something of softness and regret almost in the face of Umar. And so Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, Sahabakumullah. He said, then may Allah accompany you upon your journey. And so she went back to some of the female companions and said it was as though Umar was softening based upon his statement. And so they responded by saying that you should have more hope in the himar of Umar coming to Islam than Umar. Have more hope in the donkey of Umar coming to Islam than Umar. But there is no doubt that Allah Azza wa Jal responded to the supplication of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh Allah, Aiz, Ahabba, Ahabba Rajulaini ilayk, Umar or Abu Jahl, Aiz al Islam, ennoble Islam by guiding the most beloved of one of these two to you, 
since they were both notables, men of great honor and respect among their people and among the people of Mecca generally. And so Umar radiallahu anhu was the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided. And the narration of his Islam when he came to where the companions were in Dar al Arqam, you remember we mentioned the house that they used to go to to hear the revelation and to study with the messenger. They heard a knock on the door and they looked outside or looked through the window and they saw that it was Umar. And so they said, Wallahi, if Umar has come for what we expect him to have come for, then we're ready. Anyway, we have a deal with it. If he's come here, I need to draw blood. And we're not going to let the Prophet of Allah Azzawajal be killed. And if he has come for other than this, then we will see what it is he wants. And so, when they opened the door, he asked, where is Muhammad? And the Prophet وسلم, he said, I am here. And so Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa annak rasulullah. That I bear witness that you are the messenger of, that there is no deity worthy of worship except for Allah and that you are the messenger of Allah. And so they made takbir and they run after. And of course not the takbir ikhwan that people are, that we hear people doing now. Nari takbir, Allah Akbar. They made takbir each and every, each individual saying Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And this was a great success ikhwan for Islam and the Muslimin. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said, we did not cease to be upon nobility and were able to make our da'wah public after the Islam of Umar. That which is related to his Islam, then the Prophet wasallam, he approached the Messenger of Allah and said, who is it? From the people of Mecca, that is the greatest in spreading news. And so it was said to him, an individual was, was mentioned to him, Hasab Ilmi Al Jumahi. And so he was called and he told him that verily, Umar, I've embraced Islam. He said the individual looked at Umar, didn't respond with a word turned around and ran straight to Quraysh, shouting, Umar has embraced, Umar has become a Muslim. And in those days they would say, Sabbaut, that is you become Sabi'i, that is how they used to refer to them. You become a Sabian, like that. He said, no, I haven't, walakinni. Aslamtu li Rabbil Alameen. He said, I have not, but I, be, I have submitted to the Lord of all of the worlds. And there are some narrations that mention that the tribe of Quraysh that they set up on Umar and they beat him and they fought him and he fought them back. And this continued for a period throughout that day that he, they fought him, he fought them back until Umar radiallahu anhu was exhausted and he sat back. They left him and he left them. And he was the first to make his Islam manifest and the first to pray in front of the Kaaba or and to gather the companions in front of the Kaaba with the Prophet. And alongside this, as we mentioned, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, this great warrior, great feared warrior from the warriors among the companions and among the people of Mecca and this great archer, well-known archer from them who was the uncle of the Prophet wasallam, and he was hearing about Abu Jahl ridiculing the messenger, making mockery of the messenger and so he came from one of his travels to one of their Nawadi and the, the areas that they were sitting down and they used to speak about what was taking place and he said, who is it? that is speaking about my nephew. And so Abu Jahl stood and he said that this man, he said straight away, he took his bow, struck him in the top of his head. Abu Jahl began to bleed. 
He said, you speak about him and I am upon his religion. You speak about him and I am upon his religion. And so Abu Jahl, who was from the notables of Quraysh, was not even able to respond to Hamza. Hamza at the time said it purely in defense of Muhammad. You speak about him and I am upon the religion of Muhammad. But then the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal, because there and after he asked the Prophet, what is it that you, you, yes, you're calling to? <laughs> what is this religion? What is it they're saying about you? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained the deen to Hamza and Islam entered the heart of Hamza and he embraced. And so Hamza radiallahu anhu, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhuma, Two of the most notable and well-known feared warriors and feared yani distinguished members of the tribe of Quraysh here now embraced Islam and strengthening the deen of the Prophet Muhammad over there in Habasha the believers are, are strong able to manifest their religion able to practice their deen supported by a, a dawla and by a land and by a country and so now we have a problem as far as Quraysh is concerned now we have a real issue they're strengthening over there now notable such as Umar and such as Hamza have embraced this is a problem that we have on our hands and so they came together in the seventh year after Hijrah, and this occurred of course uh, in the sixth year after the, the uh, Afwan, after the Bi'tha, after the Bi'tha, the sixth year after the Bi'tha, uh, we then had them coming together, ayyuh al ikhwa to conspire a plot. And that is after they had exhausted every single thing that they yani all of the other strategies that they had they tried to ridicule and so they would attempt to make it be something that was uh, abhorrent to enter into this religion that all of the notables ridicule all of them see it to be just some foolishness and some madness that muhammad is upon that didn't work they attempted to persecute them physically harm them and to torment and to punish them that didn't work they attempted to turn those who were interested in islam away from it that didn't work they attempted to speak to najashi to turn him and to prevent him from allowing them to take up residence in his land that didn't work all of their efforts and alongside all of their efforts and on top of everything that they're trying to do Umar ibn al-Khattab Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib have embraced Islam two of the most notable from the notables of Quraysh and this no doubt was a problem so in the seventh year after the Bi'tha they conspired a plan to boycott Banu Hashim and to boycott Banu Muttalib Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib were the two subsections that the Prophet ﷺ and his uncles were connected to. The two subsections of the tribe of Quraysh. The tribe of Quraysh, ayyuh al ikhwa, returned back to an individual uh, in the lineage of the Prophet ﷺ who was referred to as Quraysh. As far as the lineage of the Messenger of Allah, then the Prophet ﷺ was Muhammad ibn Abdullah, ibn Abdul Muttalib, ibn Hashim, ibn Abdul Manaf, uh, ibn Qusay, uh, uh, ibn Kilab, ibn Murra, ibn uh, Ka'ab, ibn Lu'ay, ibn Ghalib, ibn Fihr, ibn Malik, ibn Nadar. Another, he was Quraysh. And so, 
from Hashim and Abdul Muttalib, which were the immediate tribes that the Prophet was related to on this end, we had all of those offsprings. Yani Qusay, Ka'ab, Murra, Kilab, Fihr, Ghalib, Malik, all of those sons had sons. And so all of those became tribes that returned back to another who was Quraysh. Nadr was his actual name. Nadr, the tribe of Quraysh stemmed from Nadr. So we had Malik who had sons, Ghalib who had sons, Fihr who had sons, and all of those sons became tribes. And so they were known as the Fakhid. Each of those sub-tribes is known as a Fakhid or a sub-tribe stemming back to another and of course another continues Ibn Khuzayma uh, going back to Kinana or another Ibn Kinana Ibn Khuzayma going back to Adnan who was one of the sons of Ismail and so these sons from another they all became themselves they had children and they became sub-tribes all of them considered Quraysh. All of them are considered the tribes of Quraysh because they all returned back in lineage to Nadar. But in particular, on the end of the Messenger of Allah, we had the Bani Hashim because we have Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim. So we had Bani Hashim and Bani Muttalib. Banu Muttalib and Banu Hashim they were those who the, were the immediate tribe of the messengers وسلم, of him and his uncles and so the rest of the tribes of Quraysh and the sub-tribes of Quraysh they decided that they were going to boycott Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib they're going to boycott them there is no selling to them there is no trade to them there is no buying from them. There is no marrying into them. There is no socializing with them. A complete boycott. And so when Banu Hashim and the notables among Banu Hashim, when they heard of this, they decided that they were going to seclude themselves away from them. You're going to boycott us, khalas, then we'll seclude ourselves likewise. And so they secluded themselves in a shi'b or in a mountain gorge that was from the mountain gorges of Abu Talib. They remained present because the tribe of the other tribes of Quraysh, they said, if you do not surrender Muhammad to us, then we're cutting you off until you surrender him. And so Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib, all of them refused, even though they were kuffar, they refused to submit Muhammad and surrender Muhammad to them. So not just the Muslims, the Muslims of Banu Hashim and the kuffar of Banu Hashim were boycotted. Muslims and kuffar. And this continued for a period of three years. For three long years, they suffered hunger, difficulty, hardship, because they refused to give up one of their tribesmen. Yes, he's calling to, to a new religion. Yes, he's calling to a new way, but he's one of us. He's one of our tribesmen. We will not give him up to be killed. And so they refused, and Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ protected the messenger throughout this even though he himself was harmed. And it was only Abu Jahl who refused and went and joined them. He said, I'm not, going to be, I'm not going to seclude myself with you. I'm going to join them. But as far as the rest of Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib, then they were boycotted for the period of three long years. The terms of the boycott were written out on a sahifa, on a scroll, 
and that was connect that was hung up on the wall of the Kaaba this boycott that occurred with them and as we mentioned Ikhwan this was something that continued for three long years a period of difficulty hardship and you imagine Ikhwan as you as believers because of the fact that you're believers this is occurring with you but the kuffar that you're calling to and that you're trying to cause them or to bring them to Islam they are now being affected by your call and this is not something that is straightforward you imagine you're here in Tobago and you're giving the people da'wah and generally as Muslims we like to benefit the people and not take from them we benefit them we bring khair to them that is the origin and if we can't bring good to them at the very least we don't bring them harm but here now on top of everything that has taken place those who are from the immediate members of the tribe were now being affected ikhwan, directly because of the da'wah and the call uh, of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and so this was something ikhwan, that was not easy and this continued for three long years they suffered hunger they suffered hardship and then towards the end of these three years there were a number of the tribe members of Quraysh who saw that this was just oppressive and what I why are we continuing this and so there were a number uh, of uh, the tribe members uh, who had decided that enough is enough that they were going to strive to put a stop to it from them Mut'im Ibn Adi and from them Zam'a Ibn Al-Asad who saw that we should come together strive and at least try and put a stop to the whole thing the Prophet Sallallahu supplicated against the one who initiated the pact and who wrote the pact and he became paralyzed in the side that he used to write and the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said that it has reached me that termites have consumed all of the pact other than the places that have the name of Allah Azza wa Jalla upon it and truly after they had left the Shi'ab and the mountain gorge of Abu Talib they found when they returned to the Kaaba they found that the pact itself the scroll the Sahifa that it had or not the pact but the written conditions that it had truly been consumed by termites other than the areas that had upon them the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this continued ayyuhal ikhwa up until the ninth year after the bi'tha and so we're now in the ninth year after the bi'tha uh, the following year the year that proceeded was a year of extreme difficulty for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because during the tenth year of the Hijrah while in that shi'b and while going through that period of hunger and difficulty his uncle Abu Talib became ill Once they left the mountain gorge and the boycott was over, in the tenth year after Hijrah, the uncle of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Talib, passed away. The tenth year after Bi'tha. Tenth year after Bi'tha, not Hijrah. The uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. It was a difficult time. Because you'll remember that Abu Talib took over custody of the Prophet ﷺ from the time that the grandfather of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, Abdul Muttalib passed away. You remember Prophet ﷺ was born an orphan. He 
He was under the custody of Banu Sa'ad. Then he returned back to his mother. His mother passed away when he was some six years old. When he was eight years old, yani his grandfather who had taken on custody of him passed away. And then from that time, Abu Talib had taken custody of Muhammad وسلم, and vowed to look after him and take care of him. And he was from the heads of Quraysh. And so, from the time or from the age of eight up until this year, the tenth year after the Bi'tha, the uncle of the messenger, Abu Talib, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, took him. And it was difficult for the messenger of Allah because of the fact that Abu Talib recognized that what the Prophet ﷺ was calling to was haqq, but he never embraced. He never uttered the shahadatayn. And so when he was upon the deathbed, the Prophet ﷺ entered upon him saying, Ya Abba, Ya, ya Ammi, Qul la ilaha illallah, Kalimatan uhaja laka biha illallah. He said, Oh my uncle, say la ilaha illallah, a word, which if you say it, I will be able to argue in defense of you with Allah Azza wa Jal. And so what was said concerning Abu Talib was that next to him, while the Prophet Sallallahu was speaking to him and calling him to Allah Azza wa Jal and to Islam, Abu Jahal and the notables of Quraysh were beside him likewise saying, Atargabu an millati Abdul Muttalib? Atargabu an millati Abdul Muttalib? Are you going to abandon the religion of Abdul Muttalib? And Abdul Muttalib was their, uh, their grandfather, their, their father, the grandfather of the Messenger of Allah. You're going to abandon the religion of Abdul Muttalib? Prophet was at the same time saying, Ya Ammi, my uncle, say La ilaha illallah, just utter the word. And the Prophet وسلم, he understood that one does not enter into Islam except by uttering the shahadatain. And in this is a benefit, Ikhwan, for the callers to Allah Azza wa Jal. And that what we're aiming at is not just agreement from the person that we're calling, because it happens regularly. Yeah, I agree with everything that you're saying, it makes sense. And I don't disagree with anything that you're saying. And we hear sometimes people say, well then you're a Muslim. No. You're not a Muslim until he utters the shahadatayn. Because Abu Talib agreed with everything that the Messenger ﷺ was calling to. There are some lines of poetry attributed to Abu Talib. وَلَقَدْ عَلِمْتُ بِأَنَّ دِينَ مُحَمَّدٍ خَيْرُ أَدْيَانٍ بَرِيَّةِ دِينَ لَوْلَا الْمَلَامَةُ أَوْ حَذَارُ مُسَبَّةٍ لَوَجَدْتَنِي سَمْحًا بِذَاكَ مُبِينًا he said, I verily, I know that the deen of Muhammad is the best deen for any individual to embark upon and to manifest. If it was not for the fact that I would be dispraised and cursed, then you would find me making that manifest publicly. If it were not for the fact that I would be cursed by them, you would find me manifesting it publicly. So he agreed. With everything that Prophet Sallallahu was calling to, he agreed that the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal truly is the deen of Allah Subhana, but out of fear of Quraysh and fear what they would say, he, he refused to utter la ilaha illallah. And it was said that the last thing that he, entered, that he died upon was the deen of Abdul Muttalib. And so it was something that was difficult upon the Prophet Sallallahu and, and Concerning this, Allah Azza wa Jal revealed, "Inna la tahdi man ahbabt, walakin Allah yahdi man yasha." Verily, you do not guide who you wish or who you love, but Allah Azza wa Jal guides whomsoever He wills. So this was a time of great difficulty for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, particularly since Abu Talib was preventing much of them from harming him. And if this was not difficult enough, Ikhwan, 
three days later, the Prophet ﷺ lost the great love of his life, his wife Khadija bint Khuwailid, three days later. And so this was a year of extreme difficulty and hardship upon the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a period of great hardship. In this 10th year, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he established the contract of marriage with Aisha radiallahu anha in the month of Shawal. And then the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went on in the following month of when he established the marriage with her as far as the month uh, then uh, there are some narrations that would indicate that it was Sha'ban and there is some difference concerning exactly uh, when the uh, marriage itself was but many hold that it was in the month of Shawwal in the month of Shawwal And of course, this was just a contract of marriage. Yani the Prophet Sallam did not live with her or yani, she didn't live with him. They were just, yani, just a contract of marriage. In the same month, the Prophet Sallam married his wife, Sauda. In the same month of the same year, that is the 10th year after the Be'atha. And it was in this year that the Prophet wasallam he went to Ta'if and he had perhaps the most difficult bout of calling to Allah Azza wa Jal that he had experienced thus far. And that is after he was rejected by all of these people, all of these varying tribes. After he was rejected by the tribe of Quraysh, after the hardship that they went through, then being rejected uh, and the boycott, then him losing Abu Talib, and him losing his wife Khadija, the Prophet ﷺ went to attempt to give a fresh group of people some da'wah, a group that he was acquainted with, the people of Ta'if, and so when he went to Ta'if, he received the worst reception that he had ever received in calling any group of people to Allah. And that is Ikhwan that they received him extremely badly. And they sent the women and children out to stone the messenger of Allah Wasallam, And he was stoned until blood run, blood ran from the head of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the extent Ikhwan that it filled the sandals of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his sandals stuck to his feet due to the blood that poured from his body and he said to Aisha informing Aisha after this affair that this was the worst reception that I had received from any of our people and that year was a trying year for the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and as he was leaving ta'if as he was leaving the city allah azza wa jal sent to him the angel of the jibal the angel of the mountains and he said to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam indeed i am the angel of the mountains and Allah Azza wa Jal has sent me to you to inform you that if you wish, then Allah Azza wa Jal will cause the Akhshabain, the two large mountains on both sides of Ta'if, cause them to come together and crush the whole city. And so the Prophet Sallallahu he had the option. He would not have been sinful. He had just been stoned to the extent that he bled profusely. And the Prophet 
being this merciful messenger that he was, he said, no, that indeed, I hope that Allah Azza wa Jal will raise among their offsprings a people who will worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wahdahu la sharika la. A people who will worship Allah Azza wa Jal alone, making and ascribing no partners with Him. And that was what occurred. We were relatively recently in Ta'if. And Ta'if, of course, before the restrictions of COVID. Ta'if, ayyuhal ikhwa, beautiful city. Yani it, it rises and it's in the mountains. Beautiful city has naturally occurring roses and a, a, a city that is filled with Iman and filled with believers, people of nice character. And that, had the Prophet ﷺ gave the command, the whole city could have been destroyed. But here, Ikhwan, we have a great benefit from the hilm and from the forbearance of that which the Messenger ﷺ went through. We, what is it that we go through in the way of Allah Azza wa Jalla for the sake of the da'wah? People mock us, people ridicule us. And we have all types of foolishness that takes place online. Thus, that is nothing. Nothing. Yani, if the trial, if the, the most that you go through is a trial, that when you see it, you don't know whether to laugh or cry. But you're not physically harmed by it. Then there's nothing near that which the Messenger of Allah and the companions went through. Yes, we're afflicted in the way of Allah. Yes, it occurs. But I, I don't recall having a sleepless night yet. As difficult as some of the trials may be. It is hard, Ikhwan, no doubt, to hear that you're being spoken ill of in a country other than yours. And there are accusations being hurled against you from five, six thousand miles away. <laughs> or for you to sit in a gathering before an audience and you can automatically see the faces who have bad suspicions and possibly don't even really want to hear what you're about to say, regardless of what it is. Yeah, and it's not easy. But it's nothing in comparison to that which the Messenger وسلم, and his companions went through. Nothing. From tomorrow's session, inshallah, we're going to see how Allah Azza wa Jal, after this period of patience, 10 years, how Allah Azza wa Jal, Rewarded the Messenger وسلم, for the sabr. Rewarded the companions of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, for their patience and forbearance. And in it, and in that which is to come, is a great dars for every single believer, particularly for us living in the West. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa fikana wa iyaakum lima yuhibbuhu wa yirda. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين